Good morning and welcome to another edition of Daily Scripture with Pastor Dave. It is day number 130, which I'm just counting the milestones by fives at this point, so maybe I should just go up to tens. But uh, boy, with another, let me think, today is November the 9th, I believe that's right. And so we have another five, probably about 40 days left together, maybe not even that many. And uh, I'm going to do my very best to continue even during the holiday weeks. Um, but maybe I shouldn't do that. Just give us all a break. We'll see what happens. I hope you had a good weekend. How has the Lord blessed you this weekend? If the Lord has blessed you in some way this weekend, I'd like for you to tell me in the comments one thing that God has done for you. I'd love to hear about it. Well, we've got some good reading today. We're going to finish the book of Ezekiel, as you can see here. Uh, there's 48 chapters in Ezekiel, so we're going to be done after today with the book of Ezekiel. And then beginning tomorrow, we're going to be in Daniel, which is something that uh, I, think everybody, I think everybody knows about Daniel. Uh, there's still a lot there, and uh, it's going to be hard to get through without taking too much time because it's so interesting to talk through Daniel. So I'll do my very best to keep it short when we go through that. And uh, John chapter 16 today. So why don't we get right into it. For the word of prayer. Father, thank you for blessing us. Thank you for giving us life. Thank you for giving us liberty. I pray, I think as we all do, that liberty would continue. We would continue to be free people that can raise our children according to our conscience. Worship according to our conscience. Now, Father, we know that when things seem bleak, that is when your light shines the brightest. So help us to be people of the faith, people of Christ, people of the book. Help us to learn something this morning. It would give us resolve to be that kind of people. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, Ezekiel chapter 46. Thus says the Lord God. Now, you have to remember that he is receiving this vision of the new temple. <coughs> Excuse me this vision that he began receiving in chapter 40. The last nine chapters of Ezekiel are this vision. So here we go. Thus says the Lord God, the gate of the inner court that faces east shall be shut on the six working days, but on the Sabbath day it shall be opened, and on the day of the new moon it shall be opened. The prince shall enter by the vestibule of the gate from outside, and shall take his stand by the post of the gate. The priest shall offer his burnt offering and his peace offerings. He shall worship at the threshold of the gate. Then he shall go out, but the gate shall not be shut until evening. Again, very specific instruction here. The people of the land shall bow down at the entrance of that gate before the Lord on the Sabbaths and on the new moons. The burnt offering the prince offers to the Lord on the Sabbath day shall be six lambs without blemish and a ram without blemish. And the grain offering with the ram shall be an ephah. And the grain offering with the lambs shall be as much as he is able, together with a hen of oil to each ephah. On the day of the new moon, he shall offer a bull from the herd without blemish, and six lambs and a ram shall be without blemish. Again, that, that without blemish piece is very important as it points forward to the perfect sacrifice of Christ. Or if this is going to be taking place literally in the millennial kingdom, as a memorial of the perfect sacrifice that Jesus already offered. Verse 7, As a grain offering, he shall provide an ephah with the bull and an ephah with the ram, and of the lambs as much as he is able, together with a hen of oil, to each ephah. The prince enters. He shall enter by the vestibule of the gate, and he shall go out the same way. Where was that? The east gate. That's the way that Jesus came in when he came through the, uh, what do you call it? I, I couldn't remember it last week either. The triumphal entry. There we go. When the people of the land come before the Lord at the appointed feasts, he who enters by the north gate to worship shall go out by the south gate. He who enters by the south gate shall go out by the north gate. No one shall return by way of the gate by which he entered, but each shall go out straight ahead. When they enter, the prince shall enter with them. They go out. He shall go out. But remember, he goes out the same way. At the feast and the appointed festivals, the grain offering with a young bull shall be an ephah, with a ram an ephah, 
and the lambs as much as one is able to give, together with a hint of oil to an ephah. And the prince provides a freewill offering, either a burnt offering or peace offerings, as a freewill offering to the Lord. The gate facing east shall be opened for him. He shall offer his burnt offering or his peace offerings, as he does on the Sabbath day. Then he shall go out. After he has gone out, the gate shall be shut. You recall earlier in Ezekiel's vision, one of the earlier chapters, I think it was 44, uh, the, the Lord reveals that only the prince will be able to enter or exit by that east gate. You shall provide a lamb a year old without blemish for a burnt offering to the Lord daily. Morning by morning you shall provide it. You shall provide a grain offering with, that, with it morning by morning, one-sixth of an ephah, and one-third of a hen of oil to moisten the flour as a grain offering to the Lord. This is a perpetual statute. Thus the lamb and the meal offering and the oil shall be provided morning by morning for a regular burnt offering. If you're just joining me, Ezekiel is describing the types of sacrifices that he is envisioning taking place in this new temple that he sees. Is this literally going to take place, say, during the Millennial Kingdom? Well, it certainly hasn't taken place yet. If it is going to be fulfilled literally, it has to be future. What some people might argue is, hey, maybe it's uh, maybe it's already been fulfilled uh, figuratively. And, uh, and perhaps there's a little bit of both. Verse 16. Thus says the Lord God, If the prince makes a gift to any of his sons as an inheritance, it shall belong to his sons. It is their property by inheritance. But if he makes a gift out of his inheritance to one of his servants, it shall be his to the year of liberty. Excuse me. Then it shall revert to the prince. Surely it is his inheritance. It shall belong to his sons. The prince shall not take any of the inheritance of the people, thrusting them out of their property. He shall give his sons their inheritance out of his own property, so that none of my people shall be scattered from his property. Then he brought me through the entrance, which was at the side of the gate, for the north row of the holy chambers for the priest. And behold, the place was there at the extreme western end of them. And he said to me, This is the place where the priest shall boil the guilt offering and the sin offering, where they shall bake the grain offering, in order not to bring them out into the outer court, and so transmit holiness to the people. So there's a kitchen, basically. <laughs> Kitchens. Then he brought me out to the outer court, and led me around to the four corners of the court. Behold, in each corner of the court there was another court. The four corners of the court were small courts, forty cubits long and thirty broad, four were of the same size. On the inside, around each of the four courts, was a row of masonry, hearths made at the bottom of the rows all around. Then he said to me, These are the kitchens, where those who minister at the temple shall boil the sacrifices of the people. This is probably the most interesting chapter. Uh, possibly in the book of Ezekiel. Then he brought me back to the door of the temple. And behold, water was issuing from the below the threshold of the temple. So imagine you go up to a door, and the threshold is literally what you walk over. He says, water was issuing from below the threshold. So we're not talking about a lot of water. We're talking about a trickle of water, perhaps. Just a little bit. <clears throat> then he brought me out by the way of the north gate, led me around on the outside to the outer gate that faces toward the east. Now, you have to remember, uh, I don't have it up right now, but the threshold of the temple faced the eastern gate. So if you could imagine, if here's, if here's the door of the temple... Here's the threshold. The water is going out this eastern gate, which is where the prince goes in and out. I would identify that prince as the Messiah, Jesus Christ. This water, it says, flows directly out that direction. So just keep that picture in your mind. Behold, the water was trickling out on the south side. Going on eastward with a measuring line in his hand, the man measured a thousand cubits. Now, how far is a thousand cubits? Well, it's about uh, 18 inches. So, what's 18 times a thousand? Um, 18,000 inches? Somebody do the math for me. <laughs> what's 18? What's 18,000 divided by, let's say, uh, 
12. Let me do some quick math here. Y'all bear with me. Doing math on the fly. Hey Siri, what's 18,000 divided by 12? 1,500, there we go. Okay, so 1,500 feet. So we're talking about 500 yards. This is uh, quite a ways that he measured and then led me through the water and it was ankle deep. So after 500 yards, it was ankle deep. Then he measured 1,000, another 500 yards. And he led me through the water and it was knee deep. So strangely, this water is growing in size. That is the opposite of what normally happens. Usually you start with raging rivers and then at some point it either just dumps into the ocean or it dies off. And we see this happen. Again, he measured a thousand and led me through the water and it was waist deep. Again, he measured a thousand and it was a river that I could not pass through. For the water had risen, it was deep enough to swim in. A river that could not be passed through, it was raging. And he said to me, Son of man, have you seen this? What does this mean? Then he led me back to the bank of the river. First of all, let's, let's, well, let's, let's read it first. As I went back, I saw on the bank of the river very many trees on the one side and on the other. He said to me, This water flows toward the eastern region. It goes down into the Arabah and enters the sea. He's the Dead Sea here. When the water flows into the sea, the water will become fresh. Ah, that's interesting. Wherever the river goes, every living creature that swarms will live, and there will be very many fish. For this water goes there, the waters of the sea, they become fresh, so everything will live where the river goes. Fishermen will stand beside the sea, from Engedi to Enaglame. It will be a place for the spreading of nets. Its fish will be of very many kinds, like the fish of the Great Sea, the Mediterranean. But its swamps and marshes will not become fresh. They are to be left for salt. On the banks on both sides of the river, there will grow all kinds of trees for food. Their leaves will not wither, nor their fruit fail. They will bear fresh fruit every month, because the water from them flows from the sanctuary. Their fruit will be for food, and their leaves for healing. Now, if you know very much about the book of Revelation, then listen to how John describes... Now, this is not... See, John is describing a different temple. John is describing the New Jerusalem. And we know it's different because the measurements are off the charts different. I mean, I think I remember reading once where the New Jerusalem is measured to be 1,200 miles square. The 1,200 miles east to west, north to south, and then up. It's going to be massive. Um, and that's even if it's literal. I don't know if it's literal or if it's figurative. But listen to how he describes this and compare it to Ezekiel here. Then the angel showed me the river of the water of life. This is Revelation chapter 22 and verse 1. Bright as crystal, flowing from the throne of God. Where did, the, where did Ezekiel's river come from? From the threshold of the door of the temple. So John pushes it back even a little bit further. It's not just coming from the threshold. It's coming from the throne of God itself. To the middle of the street of the city, also on either side of the river, tree of life. So Ezekiel says there's trees on both sides of the river. John says there's tree of life with its 12 kinds of fruit, not just on one side of the river, on both sides. In the Garden of Eden, there was one tree of life. In the New Jerusalem, the tree of life will be planted all up and down along the, uh, the river, the river of life, he says. And he says the, the leaves were for the healing of the nations. And it says here, your leaves will not wither, nor their fruit fail. They will bear fresh fruit every month. Their fruit will be for food and their leaves for healing. Thus says the Lord God, this is the boundary by which she shall divide the land for inheritance among the 12 tribes of Israel. Joseph shall have two portions. You shall divide equally what I swore to give to your fathers. This land shall fall to you as your inheritance. Now I'm just going to go ahead and warn you, this, this the, next, the reading to the end of the chapter is not going to be invigorating. Uh, it's going to be tough to get through. But uh, don't you want to at least finish 
what you started. <laughs> I know I do. Uh, let's continue. He says, This shall be the boundary of the land on the north side from the great sea by the way of Hethlon to Lebohamoth and unto Zedad, Beretha, Sibraim, which lies on the border between Damascus and Hamath, as far as Hazar Hadikon, which is on the border of Haran. So the boundary shall run from the sea to Hazar Enon, which is on the northern border of Damascus, with the border of Hamath to the north. This shall be the north side. On the east side, the boundary shall run from Haran to and Damascus, along the Jordan between Gilead and the land of Israel, to the eastern sea, as far as Tamar. This shall be the east side. See, it's it's details like this that make you think. Well, this this really need this really should be literal because why have all these very specific lines of demarcation for where the territories, where the tribes of Israel are going to be, if it's just metaphor? And that's a good point. On the south side, it shall run from Tamar as far as the waters of Meribah Kadesh. From there, along the brook of Egypt to the Great Sea, this shall be the south side. On the west side, the Great Sea shall be the boundary to a point opposite Lebohamoth. This shall be the west side. So you shall divide this land among you according to the tribes of Israel. You shall allot it as an inheritance for yourselves and for the sojourners who reside among you, and have had children among you. They shall be to you as native-born children of God. With you they shall be allotted an inheritance among the tribes of Israel. In whatever tribe the sojourner resides, there you shall assign him his inheritance, declares the Lord God. The final chapter. These are the names of the tribes. Beginning at the northern extreme, beside the way of Hethlon to Lebohamoth, as far as Hezer Hanan, Enon, which is on the northern border of Damascus over against Hamath, and extending from the east side to the west, Dan, one portion. So Dan, up at the top. Adjoining the territory of Dan, so right beside it, from the east side to the west, Asher, one portion. Adjoining the territory of Asher, from the east side to the west, Naphtali, one portion. Adjoining the territory of Naphtali, from the east side to the west, Manasseh, one portion. Adjoining the territory of Manasseh, from the east side to the west, Ephraim, one portion. Adjoining the territory of Ephraim, from the east side to the west, Reuben, one portion. Joining the territory of Reuben from the east side to the west, Judah, one portion. So that's six. How many tribes are there? There are twelve. Joining the territory of Judah from the east to the east side of the west shall be the portion which you shall set apart. 25,000 cubits in breadth. This is a huge territory. And in length equal to one of the tribal portions from the east side to the west. With the sanctuary in the midst of it. The portion that you shall set apart for the Lord shall be 25,000 cubits in length and 20,000 in breadth, a perfect rectangle. These shall be the allotments of the holy portion. The priest shall have an allotment measuring. My, my system keeps disconnecting. I don't know why it's doing this. It's very frustrating. At least it reconnects. Something to be thankful for. These shall be the allotments of the holy portions. The priest shall have an allotment measuring 25,000 cubits on the north side, 10,000 cubits in breadth on the western side, 10,000 in breadth on the eastern side, and 25,000 in length on the southern side, with the sanctuary of the Lord in the middle of it. So this middle portion shall be basically for the people of Levi. This shall be for the consecrated priests, the sons of Zadok, who kept my charge. They did not go astray when the people of Israel went astray, as the Levites did. So, particularly the sons of Zadok, who were Levites. And it shall belong to them as a special portion from the holy portion of the land, and most holy place, adjoining the territory of the Levites. So they got a special portion of land within the Levitical territory. And alongside the territory of the priests, the Levites shall have an allotment of 25,000 cubits in length and 10,000 in breadth. The whole length shall be 25,000 cubits and the breadth 20,000 cubits. They shall not sell or exchange any of it. They shall not alienate this choice portion of the land, for it is holy to the Lord. The remainder, 5,000 cubits in breadth and 25,000 in length, shall be for common use for the city, for dwellings and for open country. In the midst of it shall be the city. These shall be its measurements. The north side, 4,500 cubits. The south side, 4,500 cubits. The east side, 4,500. And the west side, 4,500. And the city shall have open land. On the north, 250 cubits. On the south, 250. On the east, 250. On the west, 250. The remainder of the length alongside the holy portion shall be 10,000 cubits to the east, 10,000 to the west, shall be alongside the holy portion. 
Produce shall be food for the workers of the city. The workers of the city from all the tribes of Israel shall till it. The whole portion that you shall set apart shall be 25,000 cubits square. That is, the holy portion together for the property of the city. There's that uh, theme of square again. Uh, if you recall, the New Jerusalem, which is full of a kingdom of priests, temple of God, because God is there, is a perfect square. What remains on both sides of the holy portion and of the property of the city shall belong to the prince. Bending from the 25,000 cubits of the holy portion to the east border and westward, from the 25,000 cubits to the west border, verse 21, parallel to the tribal portions, shall belong to the prince. The holy portion with the sanctuary of the temple shall be in its midst. It shall be separate from the property of the Levites and the property of the city, which are in the midst of that which belongs to the prince. We're talking about the future here. The portion of the prince shall lie between the territory of Judah and the territory of Benjamin. As for the rest of the tribes, you're like, Where, what about the other six tribes, man? Let's get on with it. From their east side to the west, Benjamin, one portion. Adjoining the territory of Benjamin from the east side to the west, Simeon, one portion. Adjoining the territory of Simeon from the east side to the west, Issachar, one portion. Adjoining the territory of Issachar from the east side to the west, Zebulun, one portion. Adjoining the territory of Zebulun from the east side to the west, Gad, one portion. And adjoining the territory of Gad to the south. The boundary shall run from Tamar to the waters of Meribachadish, from there along the brook of Egypt to the great sea. This is the land that you shall allot as inheritance among the tribes of Israel. These are their portions, declares the Lord God. These shall be the exits of the city. On the north side, which is to be 4,500 cubits by measure, three gates, the gate of Reuben, the gate of Judah, the gate of Levi. The gates of the city being named after the tribes of Israel. On the east side, just to be 4,500 cubits, three gates, the gates of Joseph, the gates of Benjamin, and the gate of Dan. On the south side, which is to be 4,500 cubits by measure, three gates, the gate of Simeon, the gate of Issachar, and the gate of Zebulun. On the west side, which is to be 4,500 cubits, three gates, the gate of Gad, the gate of Asher, and the gate of Naphtali. The circumference of the city shall be 18,000 cubits. The name of the city from that time on shall be the Lord is there. What an awesome time that will be. While I'm thinking about it, um, let me see something here. The New Jerusalem talks about the gates as well. Let me see what it says here. Ah. It had a great high wall, talking about New Jerusalem, just as chapter 21, verse 12, with 12 gates, and at the gates 12 angels, and on the gates the names of the 12 tribes of the sons of Israel were inscribed. So that, um, is, that is consistent with what Ezekiel says there. You have to work out whether or not you think uh, this is a reference to a literal temple, or it's figurative. I think I'm somewhere in the middle, which doesn't make much sense, I must admit. John chapter 16. Good morning, Stephanie. You know what they say. Better late than never. I have said all these things to you. Now, this is Jesus talking to the 12 disciples only, not the other big crowds that are following him. They are walking from the upper room where they've had Passover. Judas has already gone out to betray him. They are walking to the Mount of Olives. And it might be that they're already there by this point, but he is training them for the last time uh, before his death. I've said all these things to you to keep you from falling away. They will put you out of the synagogues. Indeed, the hour is coming when whoever kills you think he is offering service to God. See, my friends, being zealous is absolutely no evidence you are right. Um, I look at what's going on in this country. I look at the fervor, the zeal with which people attack um, traditional ideas, what I would call biblical ideas. 
um, there's a religious fervor to it. And I think they really do believe they are doing right. But here's the reality. They will do these things because they have not known the Father. They have not known Christ. But I have said these things to you. When their, when their hour comes, you re may remember that I told them to you. I did not say these things to you from the beginning because I was with you. Not that. But now I'm going to him who sent me. And none of you asks me, where are you going? Because I have said these things to you, sorrow has filled your heart. Nevertheless, I tell you the truth. It is to your advantage that I go away. For if I do not go away, the Helper will not come to you. Who are we talking about here? The Holy Spirit. But if I go, I will send him to you. And when he comes, he will convict the world concerning sin, righteousness, and judgment. This is why people hate Jesus, because his words convict them of sin and righteousness and judgment. Concerning sin, because they do not believe in me. I said yesterday in my sermon, you know, at the great white throne judgment, there is one sin for which unsaved people will be judged. They don't have to be judged on any sin but one, unbelief. And, um, and, that, and that's where they are. Verse 10, concerning righteousness, because I go to the Father and you will see me no longer. Concerning judgment, because the ruler of this world is judged. That is a, uh, a coy reference to Satan himself. I still have many things to say to you, but you cannot hear them now. When the Spirit of truth comes, he will guide you into all the truth. For he will not speak on his own authority. Whatever he hears, he will speak. He will declare to you the things that are to come. He will glorify me, for he will take what is mine and declare it to you through the Holy Spirit. All that the Father has is mine. Therefore, I said that he will take what is mine and declare it to you. A little while, and you will see me no longer. Again a little while, and you will see me. So what's he talking about? He's saying, in a few, it won't be long, and you won't see me anymore. I'm going to die. But then you're going to see me again. So that, it's pretty obvious what he's talking about, but we just want to understand, make sure that we're not confused there. So some of his disciples said to one another, What is this that he says to us? A little while, and you will not see me. And again a little while, and you will see me. It's interesting that they ask this because at least three times, in the book of Mark alone, uh, Jesus plainly tells them that he will die, that he will be betrayed, that he will die, and that he will be resurrected. And yet uh, they did not get it. And because I am going to the Father. I'm sorry. Let me continue. What does he mean by this? We do not know what he is talking about. Verse 19. Jesus knew that they wanted to ask him. But he said to them, Is this what you're asking yourselves? What I meant by saying, a little while and you will not see me. And again, a little while and you will see me. Truly, truly, I say to you, you will weep and lament. But the world will rejoice. Boy, <laughs> it's kind of how I feel about some other things right now. You will be sorrowful, but your sorrow will turn into joy. When a woman is giving birth, she has sorrow because her hour has come. When she has delivered the baby... He no longer remembers the anguish or joy that a human being has been born into the world. So also you have sorrow now, but I will see you again, and your hearts will rejoice. And no one will take your joy from you. And that day you will ask nothing of me. Truly, truly, I tell, say to you, whatever you ask of the Father in my name, he will give it to you until, you have asked nothing in my until now you have asked nothing in my name. Ask, and you will receive that your joy may be full. I have said these things to you in figures of speech. The hour is coming when I will no longer speak to you in figures of speech, but I will tell you plainly about the Father. And that day you will ask in my name, and I do not say to you that I will ask the Father on your behalf, for the Father himself loves you, because you have loved me and have believed that I came from God. I came from the Father and have come into the world, and now I am leaving the world, going to the Father. His disciples said, Ah, now you are speaking plainly, and not using figurative speech. Now we know that you know all things. You do not need anyone to question you. 
This is why we believe that you came from God. Jesus answered them, Do you now believe? Behold, the hour is coming. Indeed, it has come. And you will be scattered each to his own home. Well, leave me alone. Yet I am not alone, for the Father is with me. Those are words we need to repeat. I have said these things to you, that in me you may have peace. The world, you will have tribulation. Take heart, I have overcome the world. Did you get that? In the world, you will have tribulation. Why? Because the ruler of this world has not yet been cast out. He's still active. He's still evil. And he still wants to discourage you. He wants to distract you. Boy, he does both of those things, does he not? He distracts us with shiny things, with pleasure, with all kinds of things. And he discourages us uh, by trying to cause tribulation and such by breaking our hearts. Listen, guys, don't get discouraged. Don't, di don't get distracted. God has overcome the world through Christ, and we trust in him. Amen. Don't forget, our time from now on is 1030 because of some other things I got going on. I hope to see you again tomorrow at that time. Bye-bye, guys. Thank you.